Welcome to our service today. We're so glad that you have joined us. Please sing with us, clap with us, and of course, worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us. Our first song for this morning is Power in the Blood. Don't be afraid to sing and shout and dance unto the Lord. Praise God. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is
my life you thought I was worth keeping so you cleaned me up inside you thought I was to die for so you sacrificed your life so I could be free so I could be Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And so we want to make a commitment to God that I will trust you. Even in this difficult time, Lord, I will trust you. Praise God. Sing with us. Hallelujah. Trust in you, 
you, Lord, one last time. Oh, I will trust in you, Lord. I will trust in you, Lord. I will put my trust in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank the Lord. Amen. It's good to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle of this time. Amen. I, I want to read a couple verses of Scripture, and then we're going to move forward. And I, I do want to say uh, it's great to be in church today, and um, I know that wherever you are and whatever you're observing, um, I know that you've been blessed just, just in this time of worship. You can feel the presence of the Lord, sense the presence of the Lord, and certainly our focus needs to turn to the Lord. Um, if you would be at the church today, what you would see is an interesting sight because the pews are gone. Um, behind us, there is a congregation actually, and I said we'll get something on social media. I don't know if we might be able to get it on video here a little bit, but there's We've got stuffed animals that are sitting in pews or in temporary chairs that are out here. So there's actually a congregation. We've got the Kemmer family that's here. They're working today. Um, but we do appreciate all the effort that was made. And then there's a wonderful sign back there that says, We love our pastor. And that's exciting to me. That's being held by the pink monkey, I think. But it's really uh, great, amen, to be in church on a Sunday morning. So I, I've told you a couple times, don't worry, there's nobody sitting in your seat today, okay? Um, it's being saved for you. Now, we don't know how long. We'll have to wait till we get back to church. But our celebration day is coming, and, uh, and good things are happening. Um, even while you're gone, the church is moving forward in, in a lot of wonderful ways in physical ways, but then in spiritual ways as well. Let's focus on Philippians, the second chapter, verse number 19. We just read us, um, we just sang a little song, I'll put my trust in you. And um, Philippians 2, verse 19, the Apostle Paul starts out with this words. He says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus. And then he said to send Timothy shortly to you. And also he said, be of good comfort I'll be of good comfort when I know your state, because I have no one like Timothy, like-minded like him, who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own. Most people are selfish, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I will see how it will go with me, Paul said, I don't know what my future really looks like, but I'll know soon. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send Epaphroditus, my brother, my companion in labor, and my fellow soldier, but your messenger. And he hath ministered to my wants, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you heard that he had been sick, for indeed he was sick, close to death, but God had mercy on him, and not him only, but also me, lest I would have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him, therefore, the more carefully that when you see him again, you can rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was close to death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. And, um, and I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this topic today. I want to talk about facing the future. And you probably remember we're, we're on a, a series, really on a little journey that we're calling Facing an Uncertain Future. But today, I want to talk about facing the future with friends. Um, you could say facing the future with my people. Um, but facing the future with friends. Amen. So let's pray, and then we'll, 
we'll get right into the word today. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that your presence is with us and your strength is with us, your mercy is with us. We thank you, Lord, that during time of uncertainty, when we don't know the future, Lord, that, that you stand with us, God, and that we can trust, we can put our trust in in you, regardless of who is or who is not with us, Lord, you're with us. You, you're in, and you're trustworthy, God. When our heart is overwhelmed, when it seems like we don't know where to go and what to do, Lord, you lead us to a rock that's higher than we are, and you give us a safe place, Lord. And and we thank you for that. And I pray today, Lord God, that that you'd allow us, Lord Jesus, to be able to see you in a more clear way. And, and even more than that, allow us to realize what you're doing in our life. Allow our eyes to be open and help us to see through eyes of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, this is where I would say you may be seated. And most of the stuffed animals are already seated that are here today. Amen. Um. I just want to remind you of, of kind of where we've been a little bit and then we'll move forward. But the book of Philippians, you could call it a letter that Paul is writing from prison. In, and he's a prisoner of Rome and he's actually writing from Rome to a town that's called Philippi in Greece. That's quite a ways away, about 800 miles away. And he's a prisoner that is there. And in this little passage of scripture that we read today, uh, all Paul is simply saying is this. He's saying, I am so thankful that when I'm in a place where I don't know what my future is and I feel like I'm confined, I feel like I'm kind of stuck in this place and I can't really get out of where I am. He said, I'm, I'm so thankful that while I'm here, he said, number one, the work of God is continuing to move forward. So I feel like I might be confined, but God is not confined. And then he said, in the, the next thing you need to know is I'm so thankful that there's other people that are thinking about me. There's people who are concerned for me. There's people that are caring about where I'm at and what I'm going through. And in their day and in their, their time, if you were a prisoner somewhere, it wasn't like being a prisoner in one of our prisons today where if, you, if you're a prisoner, well, they're going to feed you every day. Wouldn't that be nice? And they're going to give you clothes to wear and they're going to give you a place to sleep. Sometimes being a prisoner doesn't sound all that bad. But um, but in his day, in his time, if you were a prisoner and, and someone didn't come from the outside that loved you and cared about you and, and gave you a gift or fed you, you just wouldn't eat. Or if someone didn't come and give you clothes to wear, well, you just wouldn't have clothes to wear. So in, in Paul's day, it was like really important. And when this little church in Philippi that Paul had started many years earlier, uh, when they heard about Paul's condition and Paul's struggle and Paul's trouble, they sent someone from their church over 800 miles, and you've got to remember, in those days, there's no like planes or cars. Uh, in those days, someone just has to find their way 800 miles to where Paul is. And Paul, Paul said, I want you to understand, I'm, I'm in a difficult place. There's, there's difficult things happening around me. But he said, I, I want you to know there's two individuals that are here with me. Now, all I want to do is I wanted to read this, and then I would kind of ask the question, now why is this in the Bible? And then I'm going to try to answer that question. So, uh, so Paul says, I want you to understand, first of all, Timothy is here with me. And he said, Timothy, uh, Timothy is, is someone that naturally cares for other people. And he said, and I want to send Timothy to you. So he's talking to the church in Philippi. I want to send him back to you. And then he said, there's another man named Epaphroditus that's here with me. He calls him his brother. He calls him his fellow worker. And, and he also calls him a, a soldier, a good soldier in the gospel. He said, he said, there's another guy that's here with me. He's like a brother. He said he's a super hard worker. So when, you, when it comes to the things of God, the kingdom of God, the work of God, it's not like a place where we just sit and observe other people that are doing things for the Lord. Um, but it's a place where we're involved. It's, it's a family that we're connected to. And then he says, and there's a warfare. There's a battle that's going on, and it's raging, and Epaphroditus is right with me 
in the thick of this struggle and in the thick of this fight. And he said, and, and I want to send Epaphroditus back to you. Probably brought the letter of Philippians to the church in Philippi. I want to send him back to you with this letter. And he said, because he got sick and he was concerned about what you thought about him, so I'm sending him back so that you feel better and I'll feel better to know that he made it back home to his home church. So, so like I said, we're going to try to ask the question today, well, why was this written down in the Bible? And what's so important about this? Um, and Paul said, I don't even know how things are going to work out for me, but I believe I'm going to get out of this somehow. I think I'll probably even come back to the church in Philippi. I'll be able to preach there again. But he said, I really don't know how things are going to turn out for me. So he writes, you could say, in the most difficult part of his life about two people, Timothy and a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Now, don't name your child Epaphroditus but because it's hard to say. Maybe I shouldn't make fun of Epaphroditus. If, if Epaphroditus' parents are listening, forgive me. Um, but, it's, uh, but this is a long Greek name, okay, that's, that, is, that is being spoken. And Paul, Paul says, but these people are important to me. Um, they were important to Paul, you could say, because they were important to God. In other words, people are important to God. The church is not just what you see in a building, and I'm thrilled for what's happening in our building. Um, by the way, this upcoming week, we're going to get new grass on our, on, on our yard out here, so hopefully by the time you come back to church, it'll look green. It won't just look dirty. Um, so not only aren't we driving in dirt anymore, but we won't have to walk in dirt anymore. Thank God. Um, it'll be wonderful. When you come back, I'm sure probably by that time, there'll be new carpet. There'll be some wonderful things that you can see. And there's been a lot of work that has been done since you've been gone. Even today, there's painting going on. There's, there's, uh, there's concrete that's being poured. There's lots of things happening outside of the parking lot and so forth. But here's what you need to know. That's really not what's important to God. What's important to God is not the carpet. What's important to God is not the concrete. Lord have mercy after we spend all the money. What's important to God is not the paint. What's important to God is, is not what you see uh, as far as just the physical or what I would call the temporal things. What is important to God are the people. Because people are eternal. There's something about you that will live somewhere forever, and that is why you are important to God. And you could simply say that as far as God is concerned, God's favorite way of touching people is through other people. I got a phone call earlier uh, this week, and someone was talking to me from the church and they were talking to me about the challenges they're facing during this time, and they just simply said this to me. They said, Pastor, I just miss my people. I've got to be around my people. This is the worst part about what's going on right now. I can't be with my people because my people are the most important thing during this time. I've got to be with my people. And I'm I just want you to understand, not only are your people important to you, but your people are important to God. And during this time, during this place where you feel confined, where you feel stuck, where you don't know if, if God is even around you or even close to you, God will send someone into your life to minister to you during this time. I'm, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Paul asks a number of questions, and I, I want to I read those questions, because first of all, he says these words. He says, he says, listen, he said, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he says this in verse 14. He asks a number of questions. He said, how shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? 
how are they going to call on someone that they don't believe? And how will they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? And as is written, he said, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. He said, I, I want you to understand, if God is going to touch your life, He's going to use someone that has feet to touch your life. He's not going to send an angel with wings to fly to you to touch you. God's favorite way of touching people is through other people. God is going to touch someone who will touch you. There's no such thing as someone that just ends up in the church and just says, well, it's just that found me and I'm just here just because Jesus found me no God found someone and sent that person to you somebody prayed for you somebody reached out to you somebody loved you someone did that that's how this happens God will use a parent that prays God will use a friend that loves God will use a mentor that will grow you and help you to learn things in the Lord but God's favorite way of touching people is through other people in a world you could say that's full of brokenness trouble and turmoil God still has people in this world and you could say when their influence comes across your life that influence will linger long and it will not easily be forgotten because their faith will influence your faith their courage for the Lord will influence your courage for the Lord their example of faithfulness and what God has done inside of them will somehow rub off on you it'll be transferred into your life and so you could say in this kind of a world there are people that God places here for such a time as this amen Philippians the second chapter Paul talks about some of these people um, and, he, and he, he, he says I want you to understand there's a man by the name of Timothy he records um, the fact that I have no man like him. This is Philippians 2.20. That is like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Um, he said, I, I don't have anyone quite like Timothy who's like-souled to me or who's, you could call him a kindred spirit to me that is very similar to me. And he said, the care for other people comes naturally to Timothy. In other words, he's not self-centered. Um, he's not stuck on his own interest. But he will care for you. So, so Paul said, when you're in this difficult time, I'm not going to send you a preacher that has some great gift of faith. I'm not going to send you a preacher that's known for praying for people so that they could be healed or delivered. I'm not going to send you a preacher that's just a really good preacher. But he said, I'm going to send someone to you that will care for you. I'm going to send someone to you that will really genuinely love you. I'm going to send someone to you that really has a heart from God for you. He said, that's who I'm going to send. I, I think of... Um, the words that Jesus spoke to Peter at one point after he resurrected, he said, Peter, do you love me? And actually he asked the question three times. And Peter said, well, of course, Lord, I, I love you. He said, well, then I want you to feed my sheep. In other words, if you really love me, you're going to love what I love. If you really love me, you're going to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to stop being focused on yourself. And you're going to get out and you're going to get involved in loving what I love and ministering to the people that I'm trying to minister to. Because Peter, they're going to need someone to intercede for them. Peter, 
They're going to need someone to laugh when they're laughing. They're going to need someone to cry when they're crying. They're going to need someone to listen to their struggle and their trouble and their pain and their disappointment. And Peter, the, the people out there, they're like sheep that do not have a shepherd. And someone is going to have to come along and they're going to have to feed my sheep. They're going to have to take the time to care for the people that need to be taken care of. So Peter, this is really what I want inside of your life. I want my love to possess you, and I want that life-changing love to get you out of your comfort zone, get you focused on other people. I want the heart of a servant and the heart of someone that cares for others inside of you. So Paul says, you know, what's amazing about Timothy, he said, I've seen Timothy in action. He said, it's, it's almost like a like a son that worked with his father in ministry. And he said, he said, I've seen him grow up in this, and something's been cultivated in his heart, and now it's flowing naturally out of him. Luke 6, 38, Jesus says these words. He says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again sometimes we we talk about that in terms of giving but that really has very little to do with giving it's just a principle of life he says i want you to understand what it is whatever it is you're doing that's what will eventually come back to you in your life so I could tell you today, if you want to be joyless, if you want to be miserable during this time of challenge and disappointment, you could say, just stay focused on yourself. That's how to be joyless and miserable. But if you want to rejoice in the Lord always, if you want to see this struggle and this problem through eyes of faith, if you want to see God working in your life, in amazing ways, start cultivating relationships with people. Instead of saying, I wish someone was reaching out to me, start reaching out to someone else. Instead of saying, I wish someone was concerned about me, start getting concerned about someone else. Because as you start sowing seeds, it gives God an opportunity to bring a harvest into your life. And when you start sowing seeds of love and compassion and concern, all of a sudden love and compassion and concern, it starts to come back to you over and over again. Um, years ago, I would take a week or two in the summer and I would go to a place called Spencer, Iowa. It's where I had family members that, that lived there. And my grandfather, my grandmother lived there. Uh, but my grandfather always had a garden out back behind um, a garage there at their house. And he loved raspberries. And I don't know how many of you love raspberries, but I'm a raspberry lover. And I remember I'd go out there in the mornings in my pajamas. I'd have my little bowl of cereal. And I'd pull the raspberries right off that little vine, and I'd put them right on my cereal. And I'd eat them right there in the garden. Um, and many times we might say, well, we love fresh fruit, but we don't understand many times what it takes to get the harvest of fresh fruit. Um, it doesn't come easily. It comes through struggle. It comes through challenge. But here's the powerful thing that happened in Paul's life. Because Paul didn't live his life for himself when Paul got into a difficult place, all of the seeds he had been sowing started to come back home to him. And he said, you know what? I don't even have anyone quite like Timothy. Timothy is kind of a supercharged dream team kind of guy. Timothy is on fire for God. Timothy will care for you in a natural sort of way. Uh, and he said, I, I want you to realize Timothy is someone that is going to be used greatly um, for, for God's work, and he's going to do amazing things. But Timothy learned what he learned from the Apostle Paul, 
who learned what he learned from Jesus Christ. And Timothy was someone that just simply learned how to live for God with an overcoming victorious spirit because he was around someone like the Apostle Paul. And I love uh, when you read the book of Philippians, Paul is saying, I wish I could just simply come and preach in Rome, and yet God has another plan for me. When you read, uh, when you read Philippians, the fourth chapter, what you learn is that Paul, even though he's a prisoner there in Rome, he said there's saints in Caesar's household from his very family that one of these days will greet you. In other words, God is using me to spread his message here in very, very powerful ways. It's while he was a prisoner, he writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians and Philemon, uh, and, and you could say all of those things have been a profound impact on our lives. Even to this day, uh, we get to preach from these letters. But Paul said, really, the thing that makes the difference in ministry and the reason that God can do everything he's doing in the way he's doing it is because God is able to get into the hearts of people. He's able to allow us to sow seeds that eventually come back through relationships that have been cultivated, even though it's hard work many times, God wants to use you. God wants to use me. And I even believe God wants to use this time to develop inside of your heart and develop inside of my heart the heart of a servant. We can't be in church. That means we got to think about other people. We're forced outside of the the doors of the church. We're forced outside of the walls of the church. That means we have to reach out to one another. If you're thinking about someone, pick up the phone. Give them a call. Paul said, Paul said we need to cultivate certain relationships. He said, Timothy's relationship with me is a great thing. Timothy's a great example of someone that, that is accountable, someone that's trustworthy, someone that, someone that you can look to and he'll be there. He'll do what he says he's going to do. He's got integrity. He'll make, he'll keep promises. He said he's a great example of all that. And that's where joy really comes from in your life. He gives you examples. But then he says there's another man named Epaphroditus. And when you guys wanted to send a care package to me, and it was an 800-mile journey to bring the care package. He said, this one guy in the church in Philippi said, I'll go, I'll do it. And he took that care package. He said, I know that all of you were supposed to bring it, but this one guy risked his life. He hazarded his life. In other words, he put it all on the line. And he got sick on the journey. We don't know what he got. Some say it was some Roman fever that he got, some contagious thing in, in Rome. We don't know what it was, but he almost died in the process of bringing this gift to Paul. And Paul said, I, I, I was so thankful he didn't because it would have hurt me probably more than it would have hurt you. But when you heard he was sick, he was concerned that you heard he was sick. He wasn't concerned for himself. He was concerned that the people at home would be fearful that he was about to die. So he wanted to come back to you. So I sent him back to you with this letter. So Epaphrodites came back with the letter. And he said, you know what? You should hold that kind of person in high regard because they took a risk on you. Literally, it's a gambling term, which are, probably is not used very much in Scripture, but he said he literally threw his life next to mine. Even though I was here as a state prisoner, and, and it could have looked bad for him because he came to associate with me. He came and he stood next to me anyways, even though he risked his life in the process of standing next to me. And you could say, a lot of times when we reach out to people, um, Sometimes other people look at a minister or look at people who are ministering to others, ministering to others, and they say, that's foolish. You shouldn't spend your time, your energy, your effort reaching out to a person like that. I don't know why you would put that kind of, that kind of energy into because that's just a waste of your time. Or maybe that's just a big risk. You know, every time you try to reach out to someone, you put yourself at risk. Um, what will they think? Will they be concerned? Will they really care? Um, and, yet, and yet, he said, Epaphroditus did all of those things for me. He put himself at risk for me. And, and he really reached out 
in my direction when no one else was really there. He was there for me. So here's what I came to tell you today. Number one, there's, there's people that God will send into your life during this time. There's people like Timothy, and the Bible says we should cultivate those relationships. So work on cultivating a relationship. He said there's people like Epaphroditus that will come into your life. They'll take a risk. They'll literally put their life on the line to reach out to you. And he said you should respect those types of people. Um, and so, so you should certainly be involved in that type of a ministry yourself, or you should be receiving that type of a ministry. You might say, well, pastor, how does that happen? You take the first step. You pray for somebody. You pick up the phone and text somebody. You call somebody. You get involved in that sort of a thing. And then God will bring it back to you. But here's what I want you to see. Paul said, when my back's against the wall, when I don't know where to go, when I don't know what to do, he said, God is sending people into my life to bless me. And I can face whatever it is I have to face because God is going to send me people. I'm not in this by myself. He called Epaphroditus a fellow soldier. Someone else is in the fight with me. They're going to pray for me. They're going to be there with me. They're going to help me. But in verse 19, the first verse that I read, he said, but I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Timothy will eventually leave me. Epaphroditus, he's going to come back to Philippi with this letter. But I'm going to still have Jesus when it's all said and done. And you could say that really in the fabric of these Scriptures, as you read through them, Paul is saying, yes, Timothy is wonderful. You probably remember uh, when we talked about having victory in our mind. And he, was, he, was, he said in, in Philippians, the second chapter, he said, you know what? We've got to surrender ourselves. As we surrender to the Lord, God is able to give us victory in our mind, victory in our spirit. And then he went on to say, God's given me this kind of victory. And then he went on to say, God's given Timothy and Epaphroditus this kind of victory. It's awesome what God did in their lives but in the end of it all, Paul was simply saying, you know what, even when no one else is there surrounding me, there's still one more relationship that will always be there. And he said, my trust in the end of it all is in Jesus Christ. I, there's a little song we used to sing and it says these words. It says, standing somewhere in the shadows you'll find Jesus. He's the only one who cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Him, and you'll know Him by the nail prints in His hands. You know, during the time that we're living in, you face a range of emotions. Um, I don't know how many of you see the news. I don't know that we should spend too much time looking at the news. But usually they feast on every negative thing that's out there. Um, and you go through a range of emotions, what we're facing right now. We don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. We don't know when, as a church, we're going to be back together worshiping again. I believe it will be soon, but we just don't know. We don't know. Like the Apostle Paul in Philippians, the second chapter, he said, I don't know how things are going to work out exactly. So we go through a range of of emotions sometimes we're up sometimes we're down but the one thing we do know is we can put our trust in the Lord the psalmist said when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than I am and I just I want to spend just a little time just singing this song and then we're going to pray a prayer together but we're going to sing Amen. It just says these words. Standing somewhere in the shadows you'll find Jesus. 
He's the only one who cares and understands. So standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Him. And you will know Him by the nail prints in His hand. Oh, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the only one who cares and understands. Yes, standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Him, and you'll know Him by the nail prints in His hand. Amen, amen. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank You, Lord. Thank You for Your Word during these times. God, that's the other thing that's eternal. You said Your Word, Lord, would never pass away and i thank you for it lord i thank you for people god that are a part of new life church and individuals lord that just are connected to us today god during this webcast i just pray lord jesus today that you would help each and every one of them allow the life-changing love lord of your spirit god to grow in us and help us to plant seeds lord jesus into the lives of those that are around us. I pray today that you would send people to us and I pray today that you would commission us and send us into the lives of other people. Help us, Lord, to get our focus off of ourselves and get our focus, Lord, on others. Help us to realize what you're doing through this time, God. You've got great and mighty plans. And like the Apostle Paul said, the things that look like they're against us, you're actually turning them so that the gospel is able to move forward in even a more powerful way. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to work as you've never worked before in our life during this time. God, put something inside of our heart and inside of our spirit. Supercharge us, Lord, with the love that you have for humanity. God, help us, Lord, to be able to feed others, Lord, because we've spent time in your presence and because of the faith we have in you. Help the people, Lord Jesus, that are hurting, that are going through a range of emotions, Lord God, that don't know where to go, where to turn. Lead them to the rock that's higher, Lord, than they are. And send someone into their life, Lord Jesus, that can minister to them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree. Wow.